To speak of love in Christianity is to speak of everything. And so that leaves me a fairly broad field in which to contain or address my remarks. So I don't consider myself bound, or, or rather I feel myself completely unbound by this wonderful topic. What is Christianity? I'm going to venture this definition. It is God, to use the Christian familial term, giving himself to himself in human beings. Or, to be completely fair about this thing, it is God giving herself to herself in human beings. Now, if this is a little bit too compressed or compact a concept, let's broaden it a little and say it is God throwing himself away in human beings and giving himself back to himself in human beings. What is Buddhism? At least, what is the path or the contemplative path in Buddhism? Well, here I feel myself to be uh, somewhere in the second or third grade. But just for fun and to stimulate the conversation or discussion, here is my definition of Buddhism. It is the ultimate mystery or the absolute giving itself to itself in human beings. To my mind, Buddhism and Christianity are in extraordinarily complementary in their understanding of higher states of consciousness, or as I prefer to call it, higher states of faith. Faith is the experience, the opening, surrender, and response to the ultimate mystery before it is broken down into the various belief systems that the human family has received through a natural or supernatural revelation. But the same source, the same end, and some very similar means. Not that there are not distinctions, because this God or this mystery of ours loves diversity. Pluralism is his middle name, with unity on either side. And if there's anything God, if I may use the Christian term for the sake of facilitating this discussion, and it is supposed to be about Christian, I find the word God difficult, one, because of its historical resonances and, and the various ways that it's taken. So that the meaning of ultimate mystery applied to that idea or reality seems to me to say more, especially in the context of the growing consciousness of the world's religions, of each other's um, most profound teaching and experience. God loves life, and he loves a lot of it. And he's always making it more and more of it. And so the highest form that has evolved so far of human life or in God's human adventure is precisely this higher 
state of consciousness which are available now more than ever before in human history and upon whose development and mutual understanding the future of the human family literally depends it's not going to blow itself out of this sphere Buddhism emphasizes the impersonal aspect of the Godhead. Christianity emphasizes the personal aspect of the Godhead. But the ultimate mystery transcends both. There's absolutely no human concept which can come close to a description of this mystery which we are vaguely intuiting and feel mysteriously called to pursue. And since the conference and dialogue has progressed over the last few years in some degree, it seems to me that we are ready to ask each other some rather profound questions on the basis of our mutual understanding and love. And one of these is, can you reach the experience of no self without passing through the personal experience of the mystery? I think The Buddhists seem to say that you can. And it becomes more and more obvious that the place where we will ultimately meet one another is the place, whatever that place (coughs) is, and only those who are there know, is the place of no self. And it's a mistake to think that in the Christian contemplative path there is only this personal aspect of God. It is not nearly as well articulated as in the Buddhist tradition, which offers us a marvelous technology of higher states of consciousness. That's why the Christian path has much to learn and receive from this path. But because the mystery is so great, I frankly believe that there is no path that is adequate for everyone, at least not at this phase of human evolution. I'm not projecting into the 25th century like Buck Rogers used to do in my day. The most beautiful thing about the, this interaction of the Buddhist path, as it uh, interacts and tries to penetrate the Christian experience, is that it is going to raise some questions for you, just as Buddhism has raised some questions and some wonderful questions for the Christian understanding. The reason why Christ is so important in Christianity is because in the Christian intuition or or the givens of the Christian revelation, the first thing that has to come to full development is the egoic self. Now that may be an astonishing statement for people who are trying to get rid of the darn thing. But the first phase of the Christian path is not the destruction of one's ego identity but the effort to get one. You've got to have an ego to survive in this world in its present evolution. You cannot have a polis that is a community of interacting people without verbal communication, without all the evolution of primitive man out of his identity with his environment, his identity 
with the day-to-day existence and finally his capacity with the beginning of farming to, to postpone till tomorrow his instinctual drive. And finally, the, the, the great accomplishment of, of human evolution to date is self-consciousness, which distinguishes itself from all the other primitive levels of man from which the human family has so far evolved. The human family is sitting in the middle of evolution. It has evolved from a state of pre-consciousness where it was with the beast. And its destiny is to move into a transpersonal or trans-conscious level. And so here we are crucified in the middle of, to use mythical symbology, heaven and earth. We can't go up, we can't go back. But there's something in human nature, because we have been, we know where we've come from, that in a crisis, when we're frightened, when this self-consciousness, without the experience of identification with the ultimate mystery, confronts us with with the human condition, which is called a fall, but which in actual reality is a magnificent step on the level of consciousness, but which leaves us in a most vulnerable and wounded position because we haven't the security of unconsciousness, which the beasts enjoy, have a great time wagging their tails and so on. (laughs) But they don't know that they're separated from God. But we know it. And as soon as we know it, we know that we aren't united or identified with this reality. And so we are terrified at the roots of our being. And meditation will bring you to an existential confrontation with nothingness in yourself. Because that is what the false self is. But believe me and all traditions, the false self isn't going to take that situation lying down. And so it builds up all kinds of alternatives, which we call, they call samsara, I guess, in the Buddhist tradition. And we call ignorance and, and sin, Christian tradition. But there's a common understanding that the human condition is incomplete, to put it gently or mildly. And it's bound to be in a state of unhappiness. And we're in a dualistic situation because we've just discovered that we have a self which is distinct from every other object in the universe. But if that little identity is not allowed to fully develop, you have all the neurotic problems in the religious history of man, where for the wrong reasons one becomes religious or or take certain steps on the human path. It's inevitable unless one has, begins to have the intuition that it doesn't have to be that way and that in actual fact our ground unconscious is our mystery. But how to release from that ground unconscious which is distinguished from the psychological unconscious, how to allow that to come to consciousness. This this is the problem that the great religions of the world, each in its own way, is addressing. What can we do to come from this midpoint to continue our evolution? And if we continue our own, we're continuing everybody else. So there could not be a greater contribution of compassion to the human family than out of an enlightened choice to work on your own being. And to enter into the flow of evolution that hopefully is destined for everyone somewhere down the centuries. The great possibility that egoic consciousness opens up 
is the possibility of transcending it. But you cannot transcend what you do not have yet. And this is why it, it is very important in our time to take seriously the discoveries of psychology, especially the developmental psychology, who, following Piaget and Kohlberg and others, have pinpointed the way that a human infant gradually evolves from identification with its environment, with its immediate uh, figures in its environment through the early ages of childhood until it reaches what we call the age of reason, which is, is a disidentification with the environment and the beginning of affirming one's own identity over and against all the other objects in the universe. This is not a disaster, it's a triumph. It is what being human means. And I think we'd make a big mistake to start out for a higher state of consciousness from the lowest state. You, this is a stairs that we have to climb. And it took humanity, I don't know, a couple of hundred thousand years to get to this point I think we ought to take it seriously if we want to go any higher. And it's for this reason, I think, that in the Christian scheme of things, the personal love of Christ is crucial. It is not the whole path. It is the beginning of the path. It addresses itself to that deep human existential fear, insecurity, based on the sense of being alone and alienated in a universe of other things. And it's only love, not just intellectual, experience from other people, cherishing, that can bring a human being fully to life as a human being. And it's when one has a full human identity and the self, the false self has been overcome through the preliminary spiritual path which might be called the first movement which is towards a disinterested or free or a totally self-giving love of God. In the Christian experience this is the experience of being united to God in one's inmost being in such a way that this experience is almost always there. If you look into the still point, it's not you, but Christ or the mystery. Not Christ any longer in his, in his humanity, but Christ in the mystery of his, of his glorified humanity which has been reabsorbed into the ultimate mystery. And if there is a, 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 a distinction between Buddhism and Christianity, it seems to me that is in the understanding of Christ. And that understanding might be the difference between God giving himself to himself in a human being and God throwing himself away and giving himself back to himself as a human being. Christ revealed the profundity of what corresponds to personhood in God. But God is beyond personhood as we understand it, just as he is beyond impersonhood. And he may even be, on, be beyond what we understand as consciousness. But these that I'm suggesting now, I, I humbly offer just as some reflections in our Buddhist-Christian dialogue, hardly as the last word, believe me, on the subject, simply perhaps to stimulate some thought on your part. And again, speaking as a third grader in the Buddhist tradition, it seems to me that the Buddhists also begin in a dualistic situation. Where else? Because that's where human beings all are. And although there's an, a stronger emphasis on the direction towards no-self in the Buddhist path, 
There certainly are relationships. And if you have a relationship, you have a self. It's a question of having a fully developed human self. That's the gift that one gives, what one ultimately surrenders. You have to have that gift in order to give it. And so the personal love of Christ in the Christian path is central to that first movement. And it gives the motivation to proceed. Now, at least in some traditions of Buddhism, it seems that the guru has an analogous place. If I have heard the various masters of the Buddhist traditions correctly, you can't make this journey without a master been reaffirmed in this hall several times in the past too. Now the guru in, in Hinduism or, in, or, or perhaps even more developed in Buddhism contains the state of consciousness that you're trying to reach. So over the years the object is to identify with the wisdom that's embodied in this person and to make it your own. In the Hindu frame of things this wisdom is already you, your deepest self. In the Christian scheme of reference, there is only one master, one guru, Jesus Christ. And he is conceived to be present always, as I said in our liturgy, in the community, in the proclamation of the word, and above all, in the Eucharist. So, in our view, the guru is just as present as he is in the Buddhist path. Christ is inviting us to a higher state of union with God than personal union. And for someone who has entered into the transforming union and has experienced Christ rather than oneself as the source of one's motivation, to lose the self is to lose absolutely everything. In other words, besides the dark night of the senses, which is a purification of the emotional hang-ups that we bring with us from early childhood and the development of the self. And from the night of the spirit, which purifies the roots of the soul from its unconscious motivation, stored in the unconscious. And one has entered into this incredible union, union and unity with Christ called the transforming union, what happens next? And in the Christian tradition, there are examples of, of mystics who have been asked by God, having reached this incredible state of union and happiness, to let it go and to return again to what seems to be another night of the Spirit. This time, not so much for their own development as for the sake, well, of course, it's like the Bodhisattva vow of sharing the, in, in one's own consciousness, without losing that union, the kind of sufferings that the average human being is experiencing. And, and this is the way we understand Jesus Christ, as someone who has so identified with, the, with this struggle, with this crucifixion of human nature between unconsciousness and the fullness of consciousness, this crucifixion of Christ, is like a revelation of the whole of reality. Because on the cross, Christ stands for the human condition when it's fully accepted in a person who is already united to God. And it's here that Christian practice takes on a new center. And the text for that practice is the Father and I are one. The neuter word. One thing. But not an object, please. But one reality. And that is the experience of our guru as Christians. 
that we're heading for. The experience of no self. In other words, besides the two dark nights that we are familiar with in Christian literature, there may be a third. And it is now being experienced. And it corresponds in an extraordinary way with what the heights of Buddhist wisdom call the Dharmakaya consciousness and above the consciousness of unity, of God giving himself not to you so much, because there is no more you, but to himself and back to himself. I'd like to trace for you briefly, and, and I'll just stop when the time runs out, <laughs> a particular classical human example of the spiritual path in the first phase, the first movement of it. And this is the life of Anthony, one of the most important books ever written in Christian spirituality, and literally the source of all monastic life, and the contemplative path insofar as it's a concrete path in the Christian tradition. And, and this, this is what the book looks like. You won't like it, because it's written in an old jargon that is not too attractive or easy to understand. And if you read books like you read the paper, you can't possibly understand it, because several significant stages of the spiritual journey are, are knocked off in a paragraph. So it's something you reflect on and think about. And since monks have been thinking about this book for the past 1,500 years, uh, I usually use it as a point of departure for the spiritual life. And it's in this book that one hears that classical teaching, uh, somewhat comparable to the t Buddhist teaching we heard last night. But in Christian language, it's, it's, it's conceptualized a little differently, but in this form. It's the temptations of the world, the flesh, and the devil. And what you do about them, not to fall into them. <laughs> and by, as you transcend those, you enter into deeper, deeper union with with Christ and with the Father to whom in some mysterious way this relationship with Christ opens out into after a while. So this is the life story of this Egyptian named Anthony who was born in, in a, on a farm a couple of hundred acres in lower Egypt. And he was a kind of shy and retiring young man and represented as the epitome of, of, of a devout youth. In fact, in, in reading his early life, you wonder whether it's possible anymore in our time that anyone to lead such a life. We would call it protected. But anyway, as, as eventually happens to everybody in this world, <laughs> you're something, you get thrown out of the nest the human condition. And the most wonderful situations come to an end. And so uh, when he was about 18 or 20, his parents both died about at the same time, leaving him with this little sister towards whose education he felt utterly unprepared. Meanwhile, he had been thinking about entering the ascetical life. Ascetical life in Christianity is, means exactly the same thing as practice means in Buddhism. It's the concrete exercises you take on to, 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 to confront the emotional difficulties and imbalances that everybody brings with him from the chaos of early childhood. Okay, well this young man in this predicament was, was thinking about this, giving himself to the spiritual journey and he went into the church and he heard the gospel being proclaimed. And here, here was Christ addressing him through these words. And when, when one knows how to listen to the word of God, it goes right through you to the heart. And so he heard those words as addressed to himself. And they were the classical words addressed to many saints down through the ages including most monks, which are, if you want to be perfect, 
sell everything you have, give it to the poor, and come follow me. So there's an act of renunciation and an act of taking refuge in Christ, of following Christ as your wisdom teacher. And you have no idea where you're going. You trust him and this growing relationship to tell you where to go. So Anthony went out. He could not bear the property anymore. He got rid of it as fast as he could, keeping back just a little bit for his sister. Very prudent. But this God of ours is rather relentless when he has something on his mind that he intends doing to, to deal now with God on this personal aspect but please don't limit him to this personal aspect. Whatever you do, don't manipulate God. But anyway, God very patiently came around to the same trial once again. He gives everybody, he doesn't expect human beings to respond right at once to the first call. So he gives you a little space, then he comes back and says the same thing again. So the little boy went back into the church again the, the gospel was being read and this time it was why are you solicitous about tomorrow so again he felt uh, the, the sword the two edged sword going right to his heart and he just couldn't bear it anymore so he went out sold everything put his sister with some some holy nuns who had just begun to be uh, lived together in the community they were the first form of religious life and he went and started pursuing the spiritual journey. And, and he pursues it with great uh, energy. And, and, the, and there's a little passage there which describes really the springtime of the spiritual life. Uh, many of us and many of you, however impersonal your ideas of God, have certainly experienced some kind of consolation or some mysterious way in which the ultimate mystery deals with you personally, even if he isn't a person. But anyway, you, you know that something loving, something peaceful, something tranquil, something that represents coming home, sometimes goes through you, and, and uh, samadhi is really an experience of that nature. And you don't have to conceptualize it in one way or another. But you know that you're in touch with the higher reality, or something is going on, or flowing into you, or flowing out of you, as a can possibilities of spiritual experience are, are innumerable. There are as many as people. And there are certain discerning signs that, you know, a master can tell just by your experience almost just where you are on this ladder of, of the levels of consciousness. Anyway, we're dealing with someone just at the beginning, but the beginning can be delightful and beautiful, like spring. And so... Uh, Anthony went around to all the holy men and he tried to imitate each one and at that time in his life he seems to have been able to do so. So this is what he did. And notice the, the balance of virtues that he's imitating. He observed the graciousness of one, the earnestness in prayer of another, the even temper of one, the kind heartedness of another, attention on vigils kept by one, admired one for his patient endurance, another for fasting and sleeping on the ground, watched closely one's meekness and another's forgiveness. And in one and all alike he marked especially devotion to Christ and the love they had for one another. A magnificent description of what unity and pluralism is. Unity in the ultimate values, pluralism in the air expression according to one's talents, and gifts, natural, supernatural, from God. And so because he's such a nice young man and so fervent, everybody, every monastery I know is just thrilled to have fervent novices walking around. It gives the old codgers who are a little dried out uh, a new lease on life. <laughs> but he, he was everybody's friend and he, he, he exercised his ascetical or his practice with such discretion and sweetness that nobody was jealous of him and he and he didn't enter into those competitive uh, adventures that sometimes are the hazard of beginners who really want to get someplace but they also want to be superior to other people in this new wonderful new field of spiritual devotion so what happens to him well the text says with, with a certain sardonic humor 
The devil, the hater and envier of good, could not bear to see such resolution in a young man, but set about employing his customary tactics against him. And, and so this, this, if God has a plan, this, this adversary, this other spiritual entity, has, also has a plan. Now, let's not go into this discussion whether the devil exists or not. It seems that, but I think it seems that at least on the level of the egoic self, where the average human being is, either the devil exists or he is an archetype in the unconscious of deeper levels of consciousness that will later appear as one's own consciousness. But for all practical purposes, whether it's your unconsciousness or whether he's a real spiritual entity, it gives you a hell of a time. <laughs> and, and Merton said, and I may be mistaken here, that the Tibetan Buddhists are as, are as crazy about demons and devils as the Desert Fathers were. I mean, and everywhere in, the, in, the, in a certain part of the tradition are these evil spirits. And stuff. I, I stand corrected if, if Merton was wrong. But anyway, uh, I personally think most of our troubles come from ourselves. But once in a while, when a certain temptation or crisis is extremely difficult and where it goes on and on and on for weeks and months and where there seems to be no escape, I suspect that there's some entity out there that is getting his little finger in the pie and kind of pushing. The demon is someone who kicks you when you're down and who envies the good, whether that's, that's some unconscious tendency of human nature to destroy itself or to go back to the unconsciousness of the beast, or to worship a lower state of consciousness, which we do see, and Satanism is really something like that that seems to be growing in our, this, this world of ours. It's a disease of the self, of the false self. But anyway, this is the way the, the spiritual journey was conceptualized in that period, so I'm just, we'll take, postulate the demon. Well, if he exists, he's a master stage producer. Master. Cecil B. DeMille has nothing on this entity. When the divine presence, or when the difficulties of the initial stage of the spiritual journey begin to pile up, and the consolation is now gone, then thoughts begin to emerge. And this is, this is almost the incomparable value of meditation. If you learn to sit still and be quiet, whether it's concentrating on an object, or whether it's the formless type of meditation, little by little what is in the unconscious begins to emerge. And the defense mechanisms which prevent us from thinking about the darker side of ourselves are reduced. So when the repressor is reduced, what is repressed emerges into freedom and consciousness. And you may spend you know, meditation for months and years at the movies, where your past life or your future hopes go by you endlessly matter how firmly you, you, you stick your rear end into the cushion and bite your tongue or whatever, that very practice is enabling you to untranslate reality. Uh, when we translate reality into our egoic self, we rationalize it, we try to make everything comfortable so we don't have to change. When through meditation you start dismantling your ego system, then this pain arises of thoughts that you cannot prevent or control. And so, in Anthony's uh, perspective, the devil kind of sizes you up, see whether you're a man or a woman, or what temperament you have, your historical background, and he starts dangling little pieces of bait in front of you to see if he can get you to give up your resolution to continue your practice. If he knows that if you continue your resolution, you inevitably go to the top. And so he tries by these thoughts to prevent you from doing so. In a monastery, they run something like this. And since that's my most familiar experience, having gone through it myself and met uh, many, many monks over the years and nuns who've done the same thing, it, it, it's it's absolutely inevitable. You may so it, here in a few words, and they're described in this little book. 
First he tried to make him, that is the demon, tried to make him desert the ascetic life by putting him in mind of his property. Began to think on a, I guess, a specially hot day there in his new residence about the lovely cool breezes coming off the Nile where the farm was. The lovely vista. And the thought came, Anthony, you're never going to see that beautiful property again. Okay. Then attachments of kindred. If you stay in this life, you're not going to see much of your family anymore. Even if you do, it's going to be restricted by some parlor or, or there'll be long intervals where you won't see them. Now you're just beginning to feel a little lonesome. Homesick. Homesick not only for the folks, but for, for all they represented. And on a hard day in a monastery, I'm sure many of you experienced on a retreat, when you've really had it as far as the practice goes, it challenges your motivation to think this thing through. And this is the point where a superficial attraction to the path or the practice or the monastery begins to be sifted. And your other secondary motives may be for coming. You like the liturgy, you like the music, you like the habit, you like these people. You like the possibility of a place in the country, if it's in there. <laughs> you can start monastic life for the craziest reasons on earth, but you won't stay there very long, until, unless you have the real thing. And these temptations sift one's consciousness, so that if you're going to stay there, you realize what the price is, and you must be convinced that it's worthwhile, that you're really helping those people a thousand times more if you get yourself together. Then you will have something someday to give in some way. But I'd like to warn you that it's a long trip. And, and Anthony's career shows us that he didn't open his mouth until he'd been in the spiritual journey about 35 years. That's when he emerges from the fort as a fully integrated human being that is totally human and totally manifesting the divine. Spent 20 years in solitude in order to become a true spiritual father. Doesn't come easily. Okay, well, uh, the devil... That's only the beginning, dear friend. <laughs> These positive attractions didn't work, so now he starts some negative attractions. You'll never, he says to Anthony, you'll never be able to keep up this, this practice. It's too hard. It may be all right for a week sashim. <laughs> but how do you expect to stay here for three months, or three years, or 30 years, or as in the case of, of the Trappists, for, for uh, 60 or 70 years? You know, the Trappists are kind of amusing. Uh, in, in, in the average life expectancy of a monk at La Trappe, which is the founding monastery of, of our tradition, was five to eight years. You could count on being dead in five to eight years. So, I mean, you, you can do almost anything for five or eight years. You're going to go <laughs> pass out and go to your reward. The problem today is, and this is what makes monastic life, makes most people think twice about the Trappist, is that if you make final vows there, you aren't going any place, probably, for the rest of your life. And so to live in the same place with the same people for the whole of your life, this is an appalling proposition. <laughs> and believe me, the demon points that out with great persuasion if you need to be in a period like that. How are you going to stand this life? On and on and on. The rigor of virtue or the thought comes so hard, you might die. Or you lose your health. All those things. Well, Anthony overcame all those temptations and his, and his, and his tools are interesting. They're just three of them. Great resolution. That's what waiting is. <laughs> it's refusing to go away from the path no matter what happens, no matter how long it takes, no matter what obstacles they are, I'm sticking it out. I'm here. Nothing in hell or in heaven or in between is going to move me off this path. 
That is the great anchor of determination. The second one he always uses is continuous prayer or meditation, if you prefer. And finally, great trust. Trust. Trust in another person, whether it be the guru that is before you or the Christ, the divine guru or the sadguru, at some point you'll never make it without trusting that judgment of that other person. Because everything else sometimes goes. Okay. By exercising those three things, Anthony triumphed over classical temptation of worldliness. His first, it's not even called a first victory over Satan. But I see I'm not going to have time to go through all his temptations. And so I hope there's some beginners here in the past that can benefit from this part of the discourse. For those of you who are so far advanced, you have your own uh, <coughs> teachings to proceed with. But I'd like to call your attention to something common in all those temptations. Why did, and this is the question I ask, why, Anthony, my dear friend, why, after having given up with such resolution all those pleasures and the attractions of the world and, and your ordinary fear of the rigors of the past, why did you start thinking about going back to those things? I mean, here's a young man, very resolved, very... But notice that the common element in every one of those attractions are what in Hinduism is called the energy centers of the first three chakras. The Beatitudes of Christ are also aimed at the first three chakras of reversing the value that we place on survival, esteem and affection, and power or control over others. These first three energy centers are thoroughly established in early childhood with all our defense mechanisms to protect them fully in place and many of them repressed into the unconscious where they continue to operate without our being aware of it. You just Circumstances just have to price, play, uh, push the right button on the, on, uh, on the computer and the whole damn program of early childhood and uh, in its infantile solutions to problems emerges with a splash. So what I'm saying is even with the resolution and the practice, you haven't come to terms with the unconscious motivation or with the programs that are causing these attractions to go off in your thoughts and in your emotions. Follow that just a little bit more. The emotions are wonderful gifts of human nature, and they are honest as can be, and they faithfully report how they feel about our value system. First the value system that is conscious, then the value system that is unconscious. And so, if you have a value of controlling others in your unconscious and cannot be happy when other people frustrate your plans and your projects, then, obviously, when something else happens in life, a particular incident, then your emotions faithfully say, ouch! And you experience grief, if it's a simple situation, or if it's a hard thing to get away with or put up, put up with, you experience anger, which is, these are the two sides of the effective mechanism of every human being. One that goes out spontaneously to sense pleasure and, re and, and tries to get away spontaneously from senses uh, uh, that are evil or displeasurable. And when either of those processes are complicated by a difficult, extra difficulty, then you experience the, uh, the movement of the utility ap appetite, which is that which deals with more difficult pleasures to get or more difficult pleasures to avoid. So, uh, 
as we emerge from early childhood with these instinctual needs now hardened into programs for happiness, because we don't have the experience of the absolute, the first thing is we deal with them on the conscious level. And then we experience a certain, often a joy and pleasure in, in reaching a certain calmness on that level. And it's only if we meditate regularly, and enough to put in enough time, or enter into some community where solitude and silence and some sense deprivation is, is prudently being arranged, you never set off the dynamic of the unconscious so that it, what is your deep programs that are really influencing your life can never come to consciousness. And so we, we sometimes spend our lives being, uh, deciding life's greatest questions on the infantile level. And really that's the level on which society at large is, is, is determining the most incredibly important international questions right now. It's the same style as in the sandbox. <laughs> Here, I, I'm in a sandbox and this little guy comes in and I say, get out of my sandbox. And he said, I'm getting in. And I say, you'll get out. And he said, no, I'm coming in. And pretty soon you push him out. And then if you really have a, have a nice big ego complex, you go to another sandbox and push that guy out. And, and this is it's on that basis, I'm afraid, that international problems up until the present moment are still decided. The human race is still in its diapers as far as deciding or negotiating or talking about real problems as human beings, as, as fully ego self. That's why uh, you can't shortcut the ego, otherwise you'll have a neurotic response to the higher stages of consciousness which will eventually, you know, squash you. You have to take the steps of evolution from one stage to the next and patiently work at it. Again, another question, just to make it very concrete. Here's, here's a little family and, and uh, one little girl has a lollipop. And someone takes it from her, her little brother. She's furious. It's her lollipop. And she screams, runs upstairs and hides under the bed, kicks her heels and yells. This is one response to the frustration of a value system. Her little brother uh, would react in a different way. He's the aggressive type. He would punch Susie in the nose. A much more dialogical process. He's liable to get some response. Or a third one would go uh, to mummy or, or big brother and say, make Susie give me back my lollipop. And so there you have the three breakdowns of, of temperance that Karen Hornay describes in her crisis uh, in the human growth, uh, which if those programs are never confronted head on, and if we don't take responsibility for our feelings, we we'll never know what they are, because the rationalization is to blame the problem on something outside the situation or other people. If we have a negative emotion, it's not somebody else's fault. It's our problem. And until we confront that and take responsibility for every feeling, the spiritual journey is not really begun yet. Because what will happen is, 40 years later, <laughs> whoever, <laughs> there's a new set of priorities. Now I'm ahead of General Motors or something. Board of Directors tells me, I have to resign. So I, I get the executive plane, I fly to the Bahamas, I bury myself on the beach for the rest of my life with harboring this bitterness. They treated me unjustly. They took away my company. Or, if I'm the aggressive type, I'll hire a lawyer and fight these guys to the teeth. Or if I'm the dependent type of person, I'll call up President Nixon and say, make the head of General or these board of directors re-elect It's just the same old program, never confronted, never dismantled, never reprogrammed. And this is what begins to come to come. And so it seems to me that in all the traditions, this is a crucial uh, 
level of the spiritual journey that should accompany meditation, because meditation will begin to reveal what those programs are, your value system, and you have to be willing to dismantle it. And this is, in traditional Christian terms, called the practice of virtue. But it simply means taking our emotional life in hand and being responsible for it.